Namaste, everyone. Uh, we are very honored to have with us a, a very eminent scholar, uh, Professor Ruth Vanita. Um, she has written several books, and I had read some of these uh, a couple of decades ago, um, and uh, I have totally enjoyed her um, body of work. Um, let me introduce uh, you to her formally. Uh, she gave us a very cute little bio. I want to read that. Uh, <clears throat> educated entirely in India, Ruth Twanita taught for many years at Delhi University and the University of Montana. She was a founding editor of Manushi, India's first nationwide feminist magazine, and volunteered there for 13 years. Uh, she is the author, most recently, of the Dharma of Justice in the Sanskrit Epics, debates on gender, varna, and species. Um, she has a novel, Memory of Light, uh, which she translated into Hindi. Um, and uh, uh, she has poems and translations uh, entitled The Broken Window. Her forthcoming books uh, in 2024 are um, Shakespeare's Revisions of History, Social Collusion, Violence and Resistance in Nine Plays, and a second novel, A Slight Angle. Um, her other books include Love's Right, Same-Sex Marriages in Modern India, and Gender, Sex in the City, Urdu Rekhti Poetry, 1780 to 1870, and Dancing with the Nation, Courtesans uh, in Bombay Cinema. Uh, she has co-edited The Path-Breaking Same-Sex Love in India, which I have read, um, and has published uh, close to 80 articles, scholarly articles, and has translated several works from Hindi to English, uh, most recently Mahadevi Varma's uh, My Family. Um, her translation of 16 stories uh, with an introduction um, is called On the Edge, 100 Years of Hindi Fiction on Same-Sex Desire. This is appearing from Penguin in 2023. She divides her time between Misola and Gurgaon. Um, we have uh, someone else as well uh, with us today, Srinivas Udumuri ji. Uh, he's been part of Indica for quite some time. And um, he was joking that he works <laughs> at a lab that his <laughs> wife has founded. And that's why he has the Adhikara to appear on this podcast, uh, which is <laughs> to do with women and Hinduism. Um, but uh, more formally, he is the former director. Uh, he was a former director at Indic Academy and a former convener of Indica Hyderabad. Srinivas has a deep interest in history of ancient um, Indian thought, and he's a keen follower of various schools of thought, providing counters to colonial Indian selfhood. Okay, Srinivas has a B.Tech in computer science and works towards uh, worked towards a master's degree in computer science, um, artificial intelligence in the U.S. He currently heads India's premier genetics and genomics laboratory, and he's based out of Hyderabad. Um, a very warm welcome uh, to both of you. Um, this is uh, such a momentous occasion, Ruthvanita Ji. I've read your work uh, when I was a student, when I was a PhD student. This is back in the two thousands. And uh, I've always um, seen you as a scholar who's very different from the rest of the <laughs> leftist scholarship, uh, which is, you know, uh, so so much the norm in academia. And th that's one of the reasons why uh, we have you here today to listen to your unique voice. Um, and um, I've also read your uh, work on Sulabha, used it in a class I taught, in a course I taught recently, and uh, your essay on Sita in the Adbhuta Ramayana, and I've read uh, one on friendship as well. So uh, this book, Dharma of Justice in the Sanskrit Epics, uh, this piqued my interest because of some of my own uh, interest in violence and nonviolence. I'm writing a book on that. My PhD was on Bhakti, so that. And uh, Mahabharata, of course, uh, who can escape Mahabharata? <laughs> and um, um, so, uh, so my own interest in the Mahabharata uh, was also uh, to do with how it's a Sri Shudra text. Uh, I presented a paper on this a couple of years ago. Um, and I was also interested in Mahabharata in how uh, it overlaps with the Manusmati. That's something um, that's of interest to me. So your book spoke to me on, on all of these different topics. Um, and and uh, today we'd like to have a discussion on all of these very interesting things. 
Um, so now in one of your interviews, you said that we borrowed homophobia from the British and not homosexuality. And I really love um, uh, when you say that. Um, and I totally understand uh, where you're coming from when you say that. And we'd like to invite you another time to have a full blown discussion on sexuality uh, and gender. But today we just want to focus um, on, on this new book of yours and, um, you know, discuss the topics uh, therein. Um, and... Um, so this podcast series is actually on women and Hinduism, but today we're going to include a bunch of other issues um, uh, like caste um, and, and several of the other violence on violence, perhaps. And generally the text Mahabharata as such, so as Mahabharata studies as a discussion um, directed towards that. Um, so uh, firstly, uh, my question to you is, um, um, uh, just how did you get interested in the Mahabharata? When did you first start reading it? And um... uh, but we all have, I mean, you, one can't remember the first time one heard the stories of the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, so everybody grows up with them. Uh, I must, I would have read, you know, condensed versions. Yeah, yeah, I've read condensed versions and things like that. The actual text, the reading, the whole text. I did that first time for same sex love in India, so it would have been in the nineteen nineties, um, and I read the whole thing. And then again for uh, this book, I read the whole thing more than once uh, in different redactions and so. On. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, the the reason why I ask this question uh, is partly because a, lot, a number of Indians tend to think that they know the Mahabharata. There's an over familiarity with it, but uh, only when you sit down to read it do you realize how long it takes to read it even once, and uh, you know to truly you know then um, yeah, grapple with the questions that are being invoked is is going to be a whole other effort. Um, um, so. Uh, um, Srinivasri, did you have a question in this regard that you wanted to ask her? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I have read the uh, Manitaji's paper uh, from 2003 uh, on the Sulabha Janaka uh, debate. And uh, I've also uh, read her book from 2000 uh, with uh, Kidwai as well. Um, but when I read uh, the book from 2022, The Dharma of Justice. And when I go back and read the paper from 2003, I realize that the book is already there in the paper. Um, uh, so I was wondering um, how come uh, uh, Vanitaji has taken 19 years to actually come out with this book, you know, and probably not in 2004 or 2005 itself. I hope the book is not in the paper. The paper is just, uh, <laughs> I, I updated the paper and wrote much more on it. And that is just like two chapters in the book. And there are, I think, 12 chapters in the book. So there's much more in the book than in the of paper. Of course, yeah. yeah. And why did I take so long? Because I was doing other things. As she, uh, as she just read out the list of uh, books, I was writing on other topics. So, uh, you know, I've just got around to writing on Shakespeare, which I always had my mind to write this book. So, um, that's why, because if I was doing other things in between. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I, uh, focus on this particular book is you know, heavily on Mahabharata, and that is understandable. Uh, uh, but you know, in, if you look at the paper, uh, and of course you don't specifically say uh, anything in the book itself, but if you look at the paper there, you specifically talk about how you see Mahabharata as a text that is accrued. Um, over a period of 600 years from 300 BCE to 300 CE. Um, uh, no, but there are, again, you know, this point itself is debatable in the sense that there are, you know, varied uh, opinions on whether Mahabharata was actually, uh, you know, what we see today is a, a, a redaction of uh, a very fluid oral tradition, you know, uh, maybe a recension that was brought out, and some people call it the normative reduction or the Brahminical uh, reduction, or is it uh, a, a you know a, a written text, you know, which was written by maybe a single person or a small group of people within a single generation, right? Um, um, uh, because the 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 whole thing about the critical edition, the project 
clearly shows that um, at least uh, the archetype you know, that has been derived and uh, the various uh, versions that we have are not very different. And this whole uh, thing about uh, layers you know, couldn't have been uh, at least after the archetype. You know, that uh, part of it is very clear. Uh, so how do you see uh, Mahabharata uh, as a text? Um, has your have your views changed on um, how you see it? Because uh, it is said that there's not really any evidence uh, uh, for the so-called oral tradition of Mahabharata, you know, before the redaction, you know, has appeared, uh, uh, other than you know, what is said in the book itself. Um, so, what do you, uh, what are your views on this? All these speculations about oral tradition, the same thing is done with Homer too. There was an oral tradition. Maybe there was, maybe there wasn't. We, we, as you said, there's almost no evidence of it. And so it's, to me, it's, these are all futile speculations and I mean, I'm, I'm not interested in it. So it's a scholarly game that scholars have to play, but that's fine. I'm interested in the text and the vers various versions of the text that we have, the South Indian Ascension, the Northern Army. So I, I, I look at those. I'm interested in the written text as we have it. Oral traditions are all very well, we, you know, when the when people die, the oral tradition that they were whatever oral stories they were telling is go, are gone, and unless they were tape recorded, we have no way of knowing how old that oral tradition really is. These are just things we like to uh, console ourselves with that oh, it all comes from some amorphous folk folk tradition. This is it's a very uh, obviously a very scholarly and literary a literary text, and that it's a literary text that textual tradition that I'm interested in. So, yeah. And I think uh, there was one European scholar who did a very interesting calculation. He said that one person could have written it. It's not too long for one person to write. And he uh, calculated that if they write a certain number, I forget the exact numbers, a certain number of reasonable pages every day and wrote it over a reasonable 70 year old uh, lifetime, they could have, uh, one person could have written it. So I thought that was a very uh, illuminating uh, remark. Traditionally, it's ascribed to Sage Vyasa, and um, I don't see why it shouldn't have been one person. And of course, later a few changes here and there could have been made, but it hangs together. And as I've argued in my book, I noticed uh, while reading these little phrases and words that come up uh, at different times, connecting very apparently unconnected incidents and dialogues. Um, so it, which is something you see in the work of one person when one person is writing a work. And it seemed to me that, yeah, there's a coherence. It's, there's a coherence and to it. And it is it doesn't strike me as written by committee. But who knows? Again, we, we will never know. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, here in Hyderabad, uh, you know, we had uh, a scholar by the name Pulela Sri Ramachandrudu. I don't know if you have heard uh, that name. But um, so we have seen in his lifetime, um, he has translated... 250 uh, Sanskrit works into Telugu. Uh, he would write about uh, 60, he would translate about 60 pages a day. Mm -hmm. uh, so <laughs> that's a massive amount of work. So there is definitely an example from recent times you know, how we could imagine somebody, you know, a, a single mm -hmm. person uh, actually yeah. writing this. Yeah, yeah um, I like to say that we can't settle this debate. So let's not even... <laughs> go there and uh, you know let's look at what we have so um, that's how I, I'd like to think of it as well um, I, I really liked your writing it's so simple and accessible and um, and you don't go on and on about uh, you know a point that you want to make you make it so quickly and you make it precisely and I really li like that about the book. Um, one other thing that I absolutely liked is how you contemporize the language. So you use words like ageism, single parenthood, and so on, um, which which just immediately tells us that the Mahabharata is relevant. It's, it does speak to us. And if only we contemporized the way in which we spoke about it, um, you know, we could have lengthy discussions um, that, that were totally relevant for today. Um, I had one other question. Now we are going to dive deep a little bit into um, <clears throat> uh, the text itself, your your work itself, your book itself. And uh, I want to ask you uh, why you designate some aspects of the Mahabharata as contradictions, and um, shouldn't we think of uh, those very things as things that we must explain 
rather than you know um but but why why would you say uh, that for instance uh, i'm thinking of uh, disha's dialogue uh, in which she goes on to you know repeat this oft repeated thing that uh, women are less for the whole bunch of stereotypes about women she repeats that and then there is the shambhuka story which also you deem is is a contradiction in 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 ramayan so well to begin with i would i i this is not one of my major points it's a very minor point i meant i use i just checked i used the business you mentioned it i i used the word contradiction maybe four times in the whole book which is uh, it's, it's it's not at all a major point of mine on the other hand i would say that any major text and especially a long text is bound to contain contradictions ambiguities and contradictions are fruitful it's not a negative thing a contradiction is a fruitful thing that leads to, when you have a debate there are contradictions otherwise you wouldn't have a debate right if everything was absolutely clear and consistent it would be a very boring text and there's no great no major literary text is without that kind of contradiction ambiguity etc first thing and secondly when you have uh, in the text say somebody like bhishma people change their minds this and also they may not even change their minds they may say different things in different contexts and in different moods right and that does happen in the text we see it happening as far as contradictions about say varna yes in the case of the shambhuka um, uh, story in the ramayan i pointed out i i uh, talked about how the, the various interpretations of what happens in the story that um, uh, shambhuka is meditating in order to reach a celestial world and uh, rama is told that a brahman comes and tells him that various brahman boys are dying and they ascribe those deaths to shambhuka meditating because shambhuka is a shudra and according to them he should not be meditating so rama go, uh, goes and asks him why he is meditating and for what purpose and he says it is to reach a celestial world and then rama then kills him and then he does reach uh, he, uh, to go go to the celestial world and now there are various interpretations of this of course the obvious interpretation is that because he's a shudra he's punished for meditating and that rama is doing something anti shudra by killing him like that uh, another interpretation is that there are various i gave various other examples uh, in the epics where people are doing something in order to reach a celestial world and then they die and they reach that celestial world so they actually want death and they want to reach the celestial world so shambhuka was trying to reach there and he reaches there so it's it's ambiguous but then the only thing that i found contradictory or problematic is that at the end of the story the brahman boys are revived they all come back to life now do they come back to life because he was a shudra who should not have been meditating they died because of that and now that he's dead they come back to life that's what it seems like and i i'm sure other interpretations are also available but what i meant for that there is a contradiction here it is not in because elsewhere in the ramayana and mahabharata ramayan since we're talking about the ramayan Uh, rama uh, respects shabri for her meditation and he calls her siddha samata and uh, samata and um, she goes to a celestial world as well he is very respectful to her he, he admires her for meditating and yes she's a shudra too who is engaging in these things uh, uh, even earlier than that when dashratha kills by mistake uh, by shooting he shoots by mistake a shudra boy who is an ascetic and that boy is a shudra because his parents are intervarna marriage the one of them is a vaishya and the other is a shudra and all three are ascetics and they all go to celestial world they curse dashratha and as a result of their curse dashratha is separated from his son as we know so clearly there dashratha doesn't say oh it's just a shudra i shot him so i don't care no so he's very very upset that he has uh, shot him by mistake so why then would and and he doesn't object to his being an ascetic and meditating and so on so why would rama object to uh, anyone anyone object to shambhuka meditating and then i also suggested maybe it is because shambhuka is not doing it for the sake of the meditation of sadhana itself he's doing it with an aim of getting something of reaching a celestial world is that the reason so so it's it's ambiguous and open to interpretations what i meant yeah tinosi did you have a question around it Ah uh, well, I mean, uh, there is a lot of talk about how the language in the Uttara Kanda is very different from uh, you know, uh, rest of the Ramayana, and uh, uh, the speculation about how Bala Kanda and Uttara Kanda are probably, uh, you know, something that have come up later on. I'm sorry, I keep going back to these textual, uh, uh, you know, uh, scholarly debates, but um, I mean, scholars like. Uh, uh, many traditional scholars as well uh, hold this uh, position and i've known some works written in telugu um, where uh, every kanda uh, you know there's a 
a telugu version for each kanda but they have actually um eliminated uttara kanda you know from uh, such a, a translation because the author did not believe um that uh, you know uttara kanda is part of the original ramayana um, mm -hmm. um but whatever may be the case um uh, the the it is generally agreed upon that uh, the 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 character of the the text within uh, uttara kanda is very different from rest of the uh, ramayana and um, the exact points uh, in fact uh, 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 vanita ji has made uh, in her book are made by uh, several others like for example arya samaj is also hold a similar opinion that rama's attitude towards shabri and guha and shambuka you know it, it doesn't add up you know there's a contradiction there and uh, so they use a similar language as well to describe uh, you know a, a shambuka episode um but yes but it also it could is. be that he is a king by that time and he and, a, and he's being appealed to to do something because people are dying or whatever he's being so he has he's in a different position when he's with guha and uh, shabri he's not the king at that point he's wandering in the forest he's just yeah but when he's the king then he has to perform certain duty that's another interpretation that has been given so many uh, things could be said yeah Yes. Um, so yeah. instead of calling uh, some of these uh, incidents uh, as contradiction, do you think that we must aim to, um, you know, resolve these contradictions, uh, perhaps by building a theory of what Varnashrama Dharma was, and um, you know, take that route? Did you did you ever think that that was a task that we must perform? No, I don't believe in any musts. I don't have to perform anything. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm reading a literary text and I, I, I don't have any desire to resolve the contradictions. It's good that they're contradictions. As William Blake says, I, I do I contradict myself? Very well, I contradict myself. A mind that is stagnant, he says, that doesn't contradict, that doesn't change its mind, then it is like uh, stagnant waters and breeds crocodiles of the mind. Uh, or Whitman says, I am vast, I contain multitudes. And one could say that of the Mahabharata too, it's vast and the Ramayana, they contain multitudes, any great text. So I don't want to resolve everything and come to where it's not possible. And I also don't think it's desirable. I don't want to come to one tidy conclusion and tie up everything that for that you will have to impose a formula on the text which doesn't arise from the text. So which many people do, you impose an ideological formula, whatever that formula is, and then you reach one conclusion. And that's not my style in, in any of my work. So yeah. Well, I mean, Shushumna, do you have a, a specific Varnashrama theory in mind, which, you know, when uh, read along, when the text is read along with that, you know, this contradiction disappears? Do you have something in mind uh, that yeah, uh, you I, bring up I, this point? Yeah. See, I think that we have to have a theory. I mean, we, we have to work towards building a theory. We can't escape that task. Uh, we may not be very successful, uh, and we may not have a one 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 sentence formula that, like she said, that we can apply to uh, all the texts that we have. But we must strive towards it so that you know we understand why the whole Varnashrama Dharma system was you know even put in place. What's the logic that underlies it, and so on. And I have my own theory, my my favorite theory, of course, which is uh, that it's based on violence and nonviolence. Uh, but uh, that that we must strive to build one is something that um, I, I I take very seriously. <laughs> so because that will then uh, help us see why something may not be a contradiction at all, and uh, you know that must just be Varnashrama Dharma in action, you know that uh, that shudras must not you know perform um you know um, certain kinds of uh, auspicious actions and i think i read the shambhuka story very differently that that a shudra who engages in violent professions and so on contaminates the purity of the godly words words so th this is how i read it it's a pretty, pretty a, a traditional reading and and what Rama does, uh, therefore, is just what he had to do, he, uh, his dharma. And I don't problematize that, like many other scholars out there do, that this is casteism, because I don't view it as as such. Um, so, yeah, that, that's the larger idea of Varnashrama Dharma pre present across texts, right? We have it in the Dharma Shastras, we have it elsewhere. So, um, But it is common knowledge the... that uh, when a person... Even if, let's say, sannyasa is not given to a particular person um, mm -hmm. by any you know, a guru or a, a pithatipati or a mathatipati, 
when a person has renounced the person doesn't belong to the social order anymore so it one cannot call that person a shudra so even in that uh, you know uh, scenario um your concept of coming up with a varnashrama theory to explain won't actually you know make sense there <laughs> yeah maybe not but uh, how does it happen how does one take sanyas so there is a whole lot of procedures we see in texts right for instance there has to be a guru there has to be a certain initiation there has to be a vow not to harm anyone and in this case what shudraka is do uh, sorry why am i calling shambhuka is doing uh is resulting in violence so and and as and, and uh, shatra dharma makes rama you know uh, take care of his praja and therefore he has to stop uh, you know um, anything that's violent and so on so yeah we don't know the the intricacies the subtleties of how this world was uh, during during that point of uh, time those purer times where where even words that were once said you know tended to become reality and so on and one could perform truth acts and one could you know have a debate and say uh, if you lose your head is going to <laughs> explode and these things would actually happen so we don't know what kind of <laughs> you know uh, world uh, we text are talking about so <laughs> yeah um yeah. so things to think about um since i mentioned the dharma shastras um rutmanita ji um i wanted to ask you how do you hold the dharma shastras in relation to the mahabharata or or even independently how do you view these texts um um because uh, i think that's actually a question that she was you wanted to ask and i'll let him ask in just one second because the mahabharata also claims to be a dharma shastra among other things It makes a claim about itself So, uh, sorry, Shinwaz, you go ahead. You you had that question. I mean, in this context of uh, you know talking about contradictions, right? Um, if we go back to the the, the general scholarly belief that uh, Mahabharata is a layered text and it has accrued over a period of time, uh, and it's probably written by uh, different people, uh, then it's a very easy way out to explain how contradictions you know, could actually appear because you know it is probably not possible for a large number of people to write something in one end of the text which doesn't which agrees with everything else in the text. Um, uh, but um, now I wanted to ask uh, uh, Vanita ji if no. not going back to this whole thing about the authorship uh, or the nature of mahabharata as a text um but you know when we talk about how uh, mahabharata has these debates you know that happen how do we see these debates um you know are these uh, debates uh, being uh, you know um are these debates you know included in this uh, text of mahabharata um as lessons uh, in something you know maybe not to be too rigid um um about uh, the laws you know at the 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 whole concept of dharma versus law or are these being used um as um, a purva paksha you know where the orthodox position through these uh, debates is actually being uh, strengthened and um, it is being stressed upon or do we see mahabharata as a text you know which is actually against the grain uh, in the sense that it is actually rebelling against um uh, the norm and the orthodoxy and it is uh, 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 in fact it cannot be seen as um, a text which is in fact enforcing the orthodoxy that is seen in the dharma shastra so there are different ways to look at it and i wanted to ask you uh vanita ji how you uh, see the uh, uh, mahabharata as a text um uh, on the whole well i don't assume that there's any one thing such thing as a homogenous orthodoxy i think for that we we take that up looking back uh, there isn't a homogenous orthodoxy there are various orthodoxies of various points of view if you like and figures who would be considered very orthodox like yudhishthira is not an unorthodox fellow uh, he he's he gives a whole analysis of birth based varna where he basically says that it doesn't exist that uh, we can't say uh, that there is any such varna that is based on birth because we for one thing we don't i thought that was a wonderful argument that we don't know who before dna we don't know who's anyone's father is so just because you have a father and mother who seem to 
be Brahman, but maybe your, the mother slept with somebody else who was not a Brahman, and we, we just don't know. And there are plenty of examples in the text like that. So um, you that's the first thing. And secondly, he argues that uh, uh, all bodies, all bodies, not just human bodies, but all bodies are made of the same matter, the same elements, and all consciousness is the same consciousness. So there is a difference only of degree. It's not a difference of kind uh, between human beings or between humans and animals or animals and insects. There isn't. And so he says that the self is the only thing which is not touched by action. And that is, and so basically, your varna depends on your actions. Uh, if you are fighting as a warrior, then you are a kshatriya. If you're if you are um, if you are an enlightened, liberated person, you are a brahman. And there are other examples in the Mahabharata, in the so-called Vadhyada Gita, where a shudra who is a butcher and a hunter. Um, uh, at least a butcher, if not a hunter, he he is a vegetarian himself, but he's performing this work because that's the only work he knows how to do. And he does it to support his parents. And he teaches a very scholarly Brahman. He gives him a long uh, disquisition on violence and showing that every action and every profession in the world is mixed. The Gita also says this. All actions are mixed and hybrid and impure. There is no such thing as a pure action and a pure person. That is just an imagined thing. There is no such thing as a completely pure profession, right? Whatever work you are doing, there is some indirect violence involved in it, right? And so he proves that by log logically to the Brahman scholar. And so the only thing you can do is to try to minimize the violence and try to be as little violent as you can. As long as you're alive, you are involved in some kind of violence. So to imagine that you're completely nonviolent, then you better commit suicide. That's the only way to be completely nonviolent. There's no way to be alive and completely nonviolent first point. And then he makes the point that, but we should try, that doesn't mean we should give up on it, we, we should minimize violence. And several characters say that. And he's a teacher and he says that, that we should try to minimize violence. And he also, several thinkers in the Mahabharata also make the distinction between violence and cruelty. So cruelty is what is to be avoided. Violence is inevitable. You should minimize the violence. That's it. Um, but, and at the end of this whole thing, the Brahmin actually circumambulates him. He walks around him and he says, you are a Brahmin Brahman even now, right now you are a Brahman. So even though he is working as a butcher and he is a Shudra by birth, he is a Brahman right now because of his actions and his he's a liberated person. So that's why. So clearly uh, the text shows that, and this is not, I'm just giving you one example. There are other examples. So this is, the text clearly shows that um, uh, Varna is not uh, is to be judged as based on action. And secondly, uh, but the other other characters in the text don't agree with that. They think that Varna should be based on birth. So that is what the debate is. And so the Mahabharata shows people debating. And that is what is very interesting. And the debate is, it shows that our debates and arguments are not unique to us. These debates went back millennia and people have always debated all these issues, right? Uh, the Gita also says all actions are covered by faults as fire is by smoke, 1848. So no action is pure. Every action produces consequences we cannot control and which may harm somebody and will harm somebody probably, right? So all professions involve that. But these actions don't touch the self. And Gita says five, eight to nine, the actions do not touch the self. So when you realize that, then you perform your dharma, you do your duty, but uh, and you are not touched by those actions, even if they perform, if they have violent consequences, which were not in your control, really, or may have been partly in your control. So I think that is what, um, and that Kabir, and I also quoted later Bhakta poets like Kabir, who, who says that everything in the world is jutha, everything is mixed, everything is impure, whether it's the earth or the water or the air, only the self, the consciousness, Atman is unmixed and, and pure, right? So, um, uh, yeah, so I what I would say about the Mahabharata is that it is, not taking one orthodox position, and there perhaps is no one orthodox position, but it is showing that there are many positions, many ongoing debates. And um, yeah, that's what I was interested in exploring. I think your point about there being no single orthodox position, there being many orthodox positions is, uh, you know, uh, very unique, and I, it's it's a great point. Uh, you know, so the the moment you say that, then you know which orthodoxy is it enforcing? That question has to be answered, and there is no specific orthodoxy uh, that we're talking about. <laughs> Fantastic! Yeah, I really like that. Yeah. Uh, so, but I think I mean to... one could still say that Mahabharata, as a text, does take positions in the debates, right? I mean, it's not simply uh, putting the debates up there, uh, but it is actually taking sides. The author is actually taking sides in some of the debates. 
Um, so sometimes, uh, at times, but or or a major character who's a major thinker like Bhishma, he takes a position when Janaka and Sulabha are debating. Bhishma takes a position finally at the end. Yeah. Now it's Bhishma taking that position, but Bhishma not is a major thinker and he is one of the main teachers of dharma. So we could maybe say that the text is taking position, the author is taking position. It's hard to say, but if Vyasa is the author, then he takes positions at various points. But then there are authors within authors, right? There's authorship within authorship in the text itself. So yeah, so it's hard to it's hard to pin it down and say this is the position it takes. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, yeah. from, from that sense. perspective, what is uh, what does Vyasa intend? Uh, you know, with the text, um, uh, why um, are these debates? Um, why are we reading about these debates? Why does Vyasa? Um, you know, talk about so many debates. What is the intent uh, meaning well, to convey? It calls itself an itihasa. It calls itself an itihasa, and so it is telling what happened, right? So, I mean, Sanjay is okay. narrating what happens in the world. He's narr he's one of the main narrators. He narrates, and he's also a shudra, technically. So, <laughs> Sanjay is narrating what is happening, right? He's telling us, and one of the things happening is debates, right? So, it shows that. Yeah, I think that's why it is a desire to record and to meditate upon, to contemplate, to present what to represent what is what happens in life. All right. So yeah, and debates are one of the main things that happen in life. So. Because uh, 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 Sushmana talked about uh, the relationship between the Dharma Shastra text and Mahabharata, and if you see the Dharma Shastra texts, uh, for example, uh, Manusmriti chapter ten very clearly talks about you know um, what a varna or mix you no know, of the various naming of the various uh, uh, you know mixed varnas that are being created from uh, the, the varna sankara that is actually you know happening so uh, that uh, you know, uh, chapter 10 very clearly establishes uh, that uh, it is by birth mm -hmm. and uh, there is great amount this great respect for manu mm, as a lawgiver but at the same time, there is great respect for Mahabharata as a text. Uh, so, I mean, how is this possible? Where well, uh, there is great... is a dharm shastra, but it's also more than that. It's also an itihasa. It's also a literary text. It contains, literally contains the Manusmriti. There is a version of the Manusmriti in the Mahabharata. But yes. it also... Uh, it, it's doing more than that. It's much more than the Manusmriti because it is also, for instance, I, I give a lot of uh, pay a lot of attention to Vidura and Vid to Vidura and Sanjaya. So Vidura is a Shudra technically when you're talking about Varna Sankara. So Vidura is a, a Shudra, and he, but he, but the text shows that he can do. He is a liberated person. He's the most virtuous person in the text, and he uh, ha is the most also one of the most courageous persons in the text. And no, no, uh, he uh, interesting moments occur. For example, when he, he um, uh, says to uh, he's teaching Dhritarashtra something, and Dhritarashtra says, "Why don't you teach me that?" And he says, "No, I am not in a position to teach you." He means that he can't teach because he's a shudra. And Dhritarashtra says, "No, it doesn't matter. You can teach." But then he says, "No," and then he calls Sanat Sujata. I mean. Um, Vidura calls by his powers, and it shows that he has such great powers that he's able to call this sage who then teaches. But then, in a sense, Vidura is demonstrating, though he may not be teaching, he does teach also elsewhere, but he's demonstrating how enlightened and how powerful he is. And the text is demonstrating that. So by holding up Vidura as, as the sort of embodiment of dharma, uh, the text is saying something. And also Sanjaya is another person. Sanjaya, after all, narrates the Gita. He has the same vision of the uh, Vishwarupa that Arjuna has. Uh, Sanjaya has been one of the most popular names in, Indian, in India and ever, for, uh, like Arjuna. It has always been a popular name and still is. And that is for good reason, because he is a teacher, one of the teachers of dharma. He's a shudra, but he's one of the teachers of dharma. So clearly what I'm saying is that the text may cont contains um, uh, the Manuspriti and may, and which says that Varna is birth-based, but the text is also demonstrating that uh, enlightened or liberated people are, the birth doesn't matter. Uh, Sanjaya has a vision of the Vishwarupa. Sanjaya is a teacher of Kshatriyas and, and uh, Vidura too is a teacher of people who are supposedly higher than he is in the Varna uh, um, structure. Uh, so what is the text saying? The text is showing, is showing you by actual, so there's a theory versus practice and the te text is showing that practice doesn't conform to the theory, right? That's what at least I have argued. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, but it's uh, kind of possible to see the Manasmati as also acknowledging that there are there is an intermixture of uh, castes, and therefore uh, Manu also allows you to you know uh, follow lineage in different ways. And you also pointed out in the book that lineage is not always following the bloodline. One can also you know affiliate oneself uh, to a certain kind of thinking, a certain way of life, a certain guru, a certain philosopher, and then you know trace that lineage as well, uh, which too kind of you know complicates it's the idea that things were birth-based, that uh, Varna was actually birth-based. So I, I actually see that, that, that Manusmati uh, kind of talks about, in talking about the good Brahmin and the bad Brahmin, the good Kshatriya, bad Kshatriya, the good Chudra, bad Chudra, and so on, already kind of acknowledges both Varna Sankara, that there's an intermixture of caste, and also that Varna no longer is birth-based. He, he also says something like, uh, whoever you think of as your son, uh, you know, will be your son. So pretty much this is like saying, you know, um, me and my friends, like, you know, as if, you know, family kind of, you know, takes the back seat. Uh, we tend to assume that, uh, you know, family is the most important in the Hindu world, but that's not true. We see so many other dynamics going on. And, and the book also points to that, that, that friendships are so important. Um, and, and I love uh, the, that uh, the, the work that you've done around that. Uh, simply because the idea we have, um, uh, you know, uh, of the Hindu world that filial piety is primordial somehow uh, is kind of deconstructed and, and not just in Mahabharata, but even texts that precede it, uh, you know, um, even in the Vedas, for instance, where the friendship between humans and deities is, is of so much importance, which we only see reflected in the uh, Bhagavad Gita where, you know, Krishna and Arjuna and their friendship and, you know, the whole whole thing. So uh, it's never been said that friendship is uh, <laughs> any less important. If there's anyone out there who needs to hear this, uh, that, uh, you know, you can have friends and uh, friends can be, you know, more important sometimes than family. Um, so uh, that that was uh, one thing. And um, <clears throat> Um, so th th that contribution uh, that there is in in Hindu texts the the, uh, the complicated understanding of Nashamad Dharma that itself was uh, very uh, interesting and I'd see that as the major contribution of the book. Um, but this Atman argument uh, somehow feels inadequate to me. Um, uh, Shrinivasji, if I'm rushing, uh, please stop me and take me back to uh, some of the questions that you have. Um, so the Atman argument, uh, to me, that feels uh, like it's only um, understandable and applied or applicable by an enlightened person or someone who's a sannyasi or someone who is so self-controlled uh, like Sanjaya, like Vidura and so on, participating the, in the world, yes, but somehow having an understanding, a deeper understanding that doesn't bind them the say in the same way that it binds a Duryodhana, uh, for instance. So I felt that you had to be spiritual uh, in order to even, you know, use the Atman argument in a certain way. And that the Atman argument becomes fully apparent to us only after enlightenment, as it were. Um, so, but but we keep referring to it, and that's fine, I suppose, but how far can we take it? That's the question I had. It's okay, I suppose, in the Bhagavad Gita because Krishna is saying it and Krishna is saying it's okay, be violent because the Atman has... A... But we can't use that everywhere, we can't, can we? I mean, um, when you use it in the gender context, uh, the sexuality context, it appears to me. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'd, I'd like you to respond, but still I have questions on that. So I'd like you to respond to that. I'm not entirely sure what you mean by the Atman argument. Argument when and in what context and where. Now, if you're referring to Sri Krishna and the Gita, that's not his only argument for the war. His primary argument for the war is that this is, uh, it's if you Gita has to be read in the context of the Mahabharata. If you don't do that, then you miss uh, completely the point. The point is that they have made that the Kauravas have been trying to kill the Pandavas all along, kill, rape, etc., etc., and make them torture them, and they've try to murder them and should, should such people be ruling the kingdom obviously they shouldn't if this is how they treat their family how would they be as kings that first question 
Secondly, the Pandavas have made every attempt to make peace. The Pandavas sent Krishna as an ambassador. They made every attempt. They even said, we'll just take five villages. You've tried everything. And the other side says, no, we are determined to kill you. <laughs> then you have to fight. There's not, there's no. So, uh, so Arjuna having this uh, sudden feeling that he shouldn't fight is not because he's anti-war. He's fought any number of wars and had no problem. It's only because these people happen to be related to him. The enemies happen to be related to him. That's not a good argument. Just because they are related to you, therefore they, they, they are murderers, rapists, etc. But now you shouldn't fight with them because they are related to you. So Krishna points out to him that it's his duty as a warrior and not just any warrior, as a warrior at this moment, after all that he has experienced with the Kauravas and with his wife and with his brothers, etc., it's it it, he's, it just doesn't make any sense not to fight. That's the first argument. He tells him this is your dharma and everybody will laugh at you. And secondly, if Arjuna doesn't fight, the others are anyway going to fight. Arjuna is not going to fight. Everybody else is going to fight anyway. And if everybody else fights, then without Arjuna, the Kauravas are likely to win. And if they win, what will they do? They will kill all, kill everybody. They will rape his wife, etc. Is that what he wants? Is that obviously Arjuna is wrong in thinking that he shouldn't fight at this particular moment? <laughs> So that's the main argument. And then the other arguments are, yes, that don't think that you can kill people because we have always, the Atman has always existed. And that's not unique to Hinduism. Most religions would say that, that when you're killing somebody, you're killing only the body, not the self. You're not killing whatever the Christians call the soul. It will go to heaven or to hell or wherever, according to Christianity. And in Hinduism, it will be reborn many times. So you have never not been, nor have I never not been all, all these kings. So that's a, another argument. So he gives several arguments, like any lawyer who gives several arguments to get to the point. As far as your point about Atman, that only liberated people can refer to this, I don't agree. I I uh, don't agree with that. So yes, a liberated person would be living with that every moment. And that most of us cannot do. We cannot view everything from the cockroach to, to the God as which we should as the same as the same and see the Atman and everything because we haven't reached that stage. But that doesn't mean that we cannot try. It's just like with violence. It isn't a it isn't a zero sum argument. It isn't Either you be, or with purity, either you give up on the whole thing and say, we can't be pure and we can't be, we have to be violent. Or you say, no, we have to be absolutely non-violent and absolutely pure. No, you are trying to, often one is asked as a vegetarian, uh, but what about this and what about that? Uh, aren't you? So, you know, so I'm, being a vegetarian doesn't mean that you are not harming any animal. You are, but you are trying to minimize that violence. And that is what several of the characters in the Mahabharata say, that we try to minimize it. Same is true of the Atman. No, we don't all the time see the Atman in everything, which we should, but only a liberated person can. But that doesn't mean we don't try to. We aspire to see the Atman in other beings and that we can make an effort. That's the point. And... Um, uh, and I would say that even today, ordinary people, very ordinary Hindus have that idea when they say all the gods are one. What do they mean by that? They're saying we see Atman in everybody. When you worship your child or your mother or your teacher or your friend as a as a god and everybody is worshipped at some point in their life, when I mean, you touch the feet of somebody, then you are seeing the Atman in them. And I think everyday practice reveals that. So even though you're not able to do it at every moment, you're making an effort to do it. So, yeah, that's what I would say. And Sulubha, of course, is a philosopher. This is a philosophical argument between her and Janaka. So when she's saying that your Atman and mine are the same, that there's no difference between a male and a female or any gender Atman. The Atman is the same in every being. It is a fairly simple argument that anybody can understand, when we, which we put in other ways, that yes, the body is different, but the body being different doesn't mean that the self is different. The person is not necessarily, the self is not different, right? So I think anybody can understand. And I talk in the book about the word Vyakti, which means an expression as well as a person. So a person is just person. an expression of the self, one of the expressions of the self, the very use of the word Vyakti, I think, which we still use all the time in everyday speech. It's, it's then a certain understanding of what personhood is. It isn't a unique individual. It is just an expression of the Atman. And there are different, uh, many, many expressions of that, right? So, yeah, that's what I would say. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I love that uh, that whole clarification about expression and so on, and what is uh, um, the Atman in relation to that. Uh, but I was also wondering if if you if you um, were a little harsh with Janaka because um, uh, because he's after all uh, still in the world. Uh, unlike Sulabha, he's still participating in in the uh, Pravriti kind of world. Um, 
And when he anticipates, um, you know, and asks, sir, whom do you belong to? And this is the question that every woman in Mahabharata kind of gets asked. So um, I, I, I don't, uh, you know, find it so offending or, um, uh, you know, uh, it's okay um, to be asking that. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, but Silva has a good point later when, when, when um, she makes, uh, you know, the Atman argument and you, you bring that out beautifully. Uh, but I was also wondering if we shouldn't be so harsh on uh, Janaka just because, you know, he was um, admittedly a part of the world still, not an ascetic. Um, and uh, I was wondering what you had to say about that. Well, he's claiming, yeah, he's, about yeah. his claim. he's claiming Correct. that he can be a householder in Grahastha and at the same time completely liberated. He claims to be liberated and that is what she comes to test. She comes to his court because she has heard that he's liberated. So she comes to test, is he really liberated? And the very moment she comes, the first thing he asks is, whom do you belong to? Where, where have you come from? Where, what? And he actually suspects that she is a spy sent by some other king. We find out later. So this I hadn't said in my original article, but on reading the Mahabharata again, I realize that that's what he is claiming. He thinks that she's a spy sent by some other king because he can't imagine that a young woman should be moving around on her own and should be a philosopher and should come and question him about liberation. So yes, it would be fine if he was just a householder and we wouldn't expect him to, we would expect him to ask these questions. But when he's claiming to be liberated, he's calling himself a philosopher and a liberated person, then for him to ask these conventional questions like who are you and whom do you belong to, uh, that shows that he's just like any conventional man. Then why is he claiming to be liberated? That's her point. It's not my point. It's her point. She's pointing out that you are not liberated because she says, if you were liberated, you would not ask these questions, who are you and whom do you belong to? Because you would know that you and I are the same. We are the same self. So we wouldn't ask these questions. And she's quite right with, uh, on that, I think. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also interesting how Bhishma concludes that it's impossible to do both. If you can forget about it. <laughs> that's that's pretty much the question Yudhishthira has asked, right? Uh, okay. Srinivasji, any question uh, that you want to... Oh, you can you can continue. I mean, I, I'd like to uh, take my questions towards the end. Okay. Um, so uh, I was also wondering how times have changed from you know the reality that we see in these texts, and people's conduct is not observable anymore by their actions. And this is kind of already happening in the text because um, even Duryodhana is speaking the language of dharma, uh, or even villains like. Um, Shishupala or uh, Jarasandha, I don't remember. One of them is is talking the language of dharma, uh, but using it to fight against uh, Krishna, who is an embodiment of dharma. Um, and even Duryodhana uh, does this. So, so this gap between what one says and what one does or intends uh, has already crept in by the time of the Mahabharata, and and that has only uh, you know deteriorated with time. In modernity, you. you cannot decipher anything by the conduct <laughs> of anyone. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts on uh, how uh, we must think about these things today, uh, because, um, I mean, it's wonderful to understand that Hindu texts have complicated Varnashi Madharma and its application and all of that in, in so many different ways, um, yes. But but modernity is is still such a, <laughs> there's so much hypocrisy, it's such a challenge. Uh, how do we even, you know, even with this very complex notion of Varnashrama Dharma, what do we do in modernity when, when we can't decipher, you know, what the other person is intending and, you know. <laughs> I think that's just how human beings are. Human beings, uh, that's just human nature. Sorry, I don't think there's anything to do with modernity. I think in every, I, I don't think there's any literary text anywhere in the world where there are perfectly uh, people who are completely non-hypocritical, certainly not the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. But, you know, if, if, if then you'd be writing about some other world if you were writing about people <laughs> who are completely pure and non-hypocritical. So, yes, there may be one or two people like that, uh, which maybe even in real life there are, and there may be one or two people in the epics who are like that. Vidura is like that. I don't think even Yudhishthira is like that. And as I've shown in the text, I think Yudhishthira is quite hypocritical too. So, that's just what we have, that's just life. And we are all like that. So when you look at yourself, you're not, at least I'm not free of hypocrisy myself, nor is anybody else. So you, you that's what you have to, we have to, we, I say, not just modernity in the past too, have to live with. 
and be aware of. And um, as you grow and mature, you become more uh, aware of it, maybe. So I don't think that's any, we tend to imagine that earlier times were much better than our times. I don't think they were. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, did you have a question, uh, Shinaji, about Varna Shramadharma and its... No, you, you can today? proceed, yeah. yeah. Um, so... Yeah, um, so you write uh, in, in one place uh, that every written text ever composed is in the, is in the widest sense patriarchal uh, since it was composed in a male-dominated society and patriarchy is the air we breathe uh, and so on. Um, so uh, that's an interesting paragraph there, uh, but I wish that um, maybe you've done this in your other work and it's, it's not fair to criticize uh, in this way, but I wish you had... Um, you know, explain more what a male-dominated society um, um, was here, and and uh, I was wondering if if you 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 see patriarchy, if, if one would see patriarchy here, if women had their own domains and you know had different set of duties, and you know obviously like they do. Um, so um, so I was just wondering if if there was uh, some way to elaborate uh, on what you mean there. But patriarchy, I don't use that word. I only used it here to dismiss it. I don't use that word. But but if you look at most scholars, they just dismiss the text. Basically, they frame the text. The entire argument is framed by saying they're Brahmanical and patriarchal. I don't, and I explained why I don't use these terms and what the problems with these terms is when you take them apart. Patriarchy literally means not the rule of men, but the rule of fathers, the rule of the fathers, right? It comes from that root. So the rule of the fathers, it means the rule of older men. So yes, technically, older men are supposed to be in charge, like uh, Dhritarashtra is supposed to be in charge, but but then Duryodhana doesn't let him be in charge, right? Duryodhana is a younger man who is revolting against him and, and uh, usurping his uh, powers, right? But so yes, but that the society is, present day society is male dominated and so were all past societies as far as we know. And it's very clear that in the epics, the, it is a male dominated society. And there, there is a tussle though, people are not accepting this. Older men are trying to rule it, really. younger men are being very rude to them, which I talk about, about how Duryodhana treats his elders, whether it's his father or his uncles, he's very rude to them. And as they grow older, it's not true that it's a rule of the fathers because the fathers just get pushed to one side. As you say in Mahabharata, uh, he's just very rude to Bhishma and to and to his father and he just takes over so the younger men are actually uh, controlling things as you see in other literatures as well say in King Lear right the old man doesn't get the respect that he's supposed to be getting so in Indian society the older men are supposed to or the older women are supposed to get the respect but they don't get it much of the time right the younger people are not uh, following the rules so there's that but as far as women in general and men in general there's no doubt that men have more power than women and if that were not the case then Janaka wouldn't be asking as you said that women are always asked this why if she would be asking oh, who are you and whom do you belong to but nobody would ever ask Janaka that right so uh, that is quite clear that women have their own domain and that therefore that means they're not dominated I don't agree with that at all I'm sorry but uh, that uh, <laughs> what is your own domain that you you are in the uh, for instance, you can give the example of Bhishma. Bhishma becomes the regent and he is ruling when the uh, the king is a young child, but he's always ruling in consultation with his stepmother, right? But she doesn't become the regent and rule. She could have, and that has happened in history, that the mothers become regents and rule. But the lineage itself was from fathers to sons, right? Not from mothers to daughters, at least in most communities, and not from fathers to daughters, even unless there's no son sometimes. So, I mean, this is, I think, all pretty obvious stuff, uh, that women might be ruling the home, though even there, they are not completely ruling the home, because even there, as we see in the Mahabharata, there is uh, a good deal of... Uh, conflict as well there. It, it, there isn't a neat division between the home and the other private and the public, the home and the outside, there ever is, right? But even if they were, even if women were just ruling the home, well, that would be nice, but that doesn't mean that they have the same amount of power as men have, that they can travel equally. Uh, you can see the numbers. I've talked about the female sages, but look at the numbers of male sages and the numbers of female sages. So we always quote Gargi and uh, rightly we quote Gargi and Marthali and all of these people. And yes, so there, there are many women philosophers, but the numbers are certainly not, not even anywhere near equal, right? Uh, so that itself tells you something. Why is that? 
uh, the case. So you could have very weak theories, but it doesn't matter what your theories are. The fact is that there are fewer women philosophers than male philosophers. Uh, it's great that there are women philosophers because there are many religious traditions where there are no women philosophers. I, without taking any names, there are no there are many um, uh, cultures and religions where there are no women philosophers or teachers or anything. But uh, here there are. So that's good. But the numbers are not the same. Right. So it is. And, and those who are women philosophers like Sulabha are face certain problems. They overcome them, but they do face these problems. Right. Or Disha or anyone. So that's what I meant. Yeah. And what I was saying about patriarchy is the heavy breather. I meant that to say the text is patriarchal and so it's bad and it's oppressive because it's patriarchal is not a very useful thing to say. Because every <laughs> you want to say it is produced in a male dominated society or written by a man, men, probably we don't know for sure who wrote it, but that it must be written by a man, everything written by a man must be patriarchal. This doesn't to me make any sense because then, then you may as well dismiss all literature or 99% yes. must be as patriarchal <laughs> and then stop reading, then go and do something else, start cooking or doing cookery. If you're going to be reading, <laughs> then to just say that everything is patriarchal, what's the use of that? It's like saying all men are mortal. Yes, we know that. Now move on and say something more, more specific and interesting. <laughs> yeah, no. no, I was in complete agreement with what you have said there. You know, it, uh, it, it makes perfect sense. One cannot uh, hold that as an argument against the text itself. You know, when the text offers something else, that mm -hmm. is what we need to look at and not uh, condemn the text based on right. uh, some modern, um, yeah. And assuming that also that a text which is written by a man, let's assume that it was written by a man. So if the text is written by a man, does that mean it's necessarily anti-women? Or No, I don't agree. I, I don't think that all men think the same way or all women think the same way. And uh, uh, I don't think that they all take the same views of any anything. You know, there are so as, as I've said, that there's so many views. So uh, the men in the text, you can see that the difference between the men in the text, they all take different views and they don't agree with each other. So just saying that they are men and therefore they're sort of reading again, that doesn't tell you anything. Just saying that they are men and they are, you know, it's, it's not. Yeah. yeah. And and many times these sort of arguments are used only against Hindu texts and they are not other words. They're also uh, used in concept. the West. Any text by a dead okay. white man. So let's why, why do we ah. check it because he's a dead white man? So it's not unique to him. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, how we understand women's power or power itself, the parameter that we use to understand women's power, that itself, yeah, is something that we must think about much, much more. Um, I I really like your analysis of the Amba story. It was uh, truly beautiful. It was. My, in my mind too, the same question would pop up all the time when I read that story. That why why doesn't she if she chose asceticism, why choose it for revenge? Why not just you know uh, do it for its own sake? Um, but but it also emphasizes something else for me, and that is the importance of Sri Dharma, that that path. Um, she doesn't want to take the ascetic path at all. That's not her intention. She wants to marry, and that's how she wants to you know proceed. And and when when all these other sages collude, and I kind of uh, understand what you what you're trying to say when um, when you say that dialogues can also be you know <laughs> that that was so unique the, the way you say it. Um, but uh, but I also thought that the way in which all these sages sat together and tried to help her and Parshurama came in and so many others, you know, um, uh, collaborated to 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 see to it that this woman you know is is somehow restored her place uh, as it were. Uh, that showed to me that Sri Dharma was taken so seriously, that women were so, taken so seriously, and that if some woman out there did not have the option of Sri Dharma, that that was, you know, treated with so much seriousness that that she must belong somewhere so that she can perform her duties, and and so on. So I felt that uh, we 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 might not be you know in a position to say that Amma should have done asceticism for it for its own sake. She didn't want to. She she and we can't force asceticism on, you know, uh, people. Um, and and that that's a very uh, important thing to understand because um, you know we tend to take it very lightly. Asceticism is not easy. It's 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 very hard. And um, some of I us are not asceticism only because she brought it up. She thought mm -hmm. of it as an option, and she said that she would become an ascetic. And then her grandfather and others dissuaded her from that and said, "No, you should try to take revenge." 
So, uh, and that, and then she wasn't even sure who had caused her problem. Was it her ex-lover? Was it her, it, there were so many possibilities. Was she herself had handled things wrongly? Was it her father? Was it Bhishma? And then all the other men persuade her that it is Bhishma who's responsible. Whereas he's only one of the factors in the whole situation that led to, that led to this, right? Uh, and then I would also say that, uh, yes, of course, she shouldn't be forced to be an ascetic. And I was certainly not suggesting that she should be. But sometimes there are situations where you can't get what you want. Every woman cannot get married, right? And in any, any society, it may not happen. Or every man, there are many men who want to get married and can't get married, right? They can't find anyone to get married. Okay, so now what is the what are the options open to you? Do you get really embittered like she does and say, no, now I'm going to... She could have said, I want to be reborn and be married as a woman in the next life, right? She could have said that. That would be the kind of obvious thing if she's thinking of rebirth. Instead, she says, no, I want to be reborn as a man to kill Vishma. Now, is this a helpful... Uh, this reminded me of a lot of women at Manusha used to come and their main aim and, and the, she had broken up with her husband and so instead of thinking now how can I make my life better and go on and either work or remarry or do whatever their main aim is how can I take revenge on my husband which is not a great thing for you it's not good to be obsessed with revenge and I you know I used to think of the Shikhandan story as this wonderful story of sex change and uh, she's a woman who marries a woman and then becomes a man and all that's because I hadn't read it closely and when I read again the Mahabharata closely and looked at Shikhandin, not just in that story, but throughout the Mahabharata, what does Shikhandin do after Shikhandini becomes Shikhandin? And I looked at, I found that this character is very obsessed with revenge and death and killing, not revenge actually, because Shikhandin doesn't even remember that he was Amba in a previous birth. So it's not revenge, it's just that he wants to kill Bhishma, he's driven by this desire to kill. And it's not good for anybody and not certainly good for himself as Shikhandin. Because he's not able to think or talk or do anything else in the text except only want to kill. And he's not a great warrior either. He's a sort of average warrior. And ultimately can only kill Bhishma by helping Arjuna. He doesn't kill on his own, right? So it was. it's not a life well lived if you look at it. Whether it's Ambat's life or Shikandini's and Shikandin's life, it, compared to many other characters in the text, it really isn't a life worth lived, uh, well lived. And so I, I ended up with not a very positive view of uh, Shikandini Shikandin at all, uh, which was there are other characters who change sex in the uh, in the text like um, Mangashwana who are much more positive characters, but Shikandin is the famous one, and I ended up I was surprised myself by what I found and I that I was not favorably impressed by Shikandin at all, and I counted uh, you've seen in the book I counted the number of battles that Shikandin engaged in and how many times Shikandin actually won and much of the time he's being defeated and carried off the field. <laughs> He's so overwhelmed by the desire to kill that he's the opposite of what Krishna is telling Arjuna to do, that you fight not with the aim of anger and killing, but with the aim of doing your duty. But no, this Shikandan is filled with rage all the time and rage actually gets in the way of doing what you want to do, right? It doesn't help. It's not helpful to you. So... Um, yeah, so that, that's what I meant by uh, saying that I, I wasn't suggesting that she should be an ascetic, but I was also saying that uh, should she be so obsessed with revenge? I'm not sure that that's the best thing either. So, yeah. And are those the only two options? Um, yeah. yeah. Um, she has any questions? Uh, how much more time do we have? Uh, 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 we have 20... It's been an hour and a little bit more. Uh, we can go on. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have definitely one more question, but... Uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, just that uh, the word Virya Shulka, you, you didn't mention the Amba story, and that some of your analysis, uh, just something to think about, uh, some of your analysis might have gained a whole other color if you had just uh, acknowledged that this kind of marriage, Amba's kind of marriage, was uh, Virya Shulka. Um, sorry, minor point there, but uh, let me look at... Um, um, Yeah, I have a couple of more, a uh, uh, couple more points that I'd like to make, but uh, you go ahead, Srinivasji. Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> I mean, while you're still in, you know, talking about uh, uh, episodes from the text, probably we should stick to that because uh, the questions that I have are not dealing with the text or book per se, but you know, there are other things. So probably oh. if you have, uh, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, so I really uh, um, 
had only one disagreement with the book in in all, almost all your analysis i was like on board uh, but uh, only the kanya kubja the the that story is actually the only one where i thought i would interpret it differently um because uh, the most noble um, form of marriage is the brahma vivaha and when vayu uh, uh, proposes he is doing so with uh by bartering uh, kind of right because he's saying i'll give you something in return and that's that you can live in heaven uh, for very long like the gods and so on so the kind of marriage that uh, vayu seems to be proposing is one of uh, you know again uh, something that has a bright prize or you know a kanya shulka you could say or even um you know a form of marriage that is uh, much lower in the in the rung of uh, marriages uh, good marriages um so th- that's the only reason probably why the the you know, the daughters kushanaba's daughters say that they they don't want to marry him because they, they want to be given away by the father and you know so i thought that 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 point might have been a little differently um and i think mean, so fine for them to refuse he makes a proposal and they refuse i don't think it's a bartering marriage because that kind of marriage is where you make the offer of the money to the father not to the girls themselves uh, when this is also not a human being it is a god trying to marry a human woman right so when gods try to marry human women which are there are many examples of that when the gods marry human women then the human women become immortal whether it's in hindu texts or greek texts the hindu women the woman would become immortal right when a god marries you that's what he's suggesting that you heal they get a kind of immortality that the deities have uh, so it's being it's not they're not making an offer to their father of money to buy them he is uh, setting telling them the benefits of marrying him and i would consider this a gandharva viva because it's he's saying he's attracted to them and would they like to marry him and then they will get these benefits from that and it's fine for them to refuse it but then they go and report it to their father and as i pointed out in the text they report it in a very misleading way they attribute words to him that he never said and so they're trying to make their father angry so that he will go and fight but the father says no he suggests forgiveness so that was my point yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um my my very last point would be that i absolutely loved your uh, conclusion where where you talk about synthetic uh, thinking mm-hmm. and where you point out that there is no anthropocentrism in the hindu world that um, that all sentient beings must be protected and reason is not the criteria that we must use but the fact that you know beings feel pain and pleasure and if they do then they must be you know um, their well being must be ensured and that that hindu thought imputes consciousness to all living beings and uh, that a sympathetic Im- imagination you say that uh, is is what should make humans human um and um, and and you say that the the ideas of equality that this is that this is far this is you say it is more far reaching than ideas of equality in european thought i thought that this was just truly truly brilliant um because most people end every argument today by saying there's nothing more important than western law that western law has nailed it somehow and they think that there is no alternative to to that almost every debate you will hear people say the constitution is the final word on <laughs> on everything uh, without realizing that the premises uh, that that are there uh, within um, are something that we can rethink always using several other kinds of resources from you know traditional thinking I love this passage in the Gita which talks about the three ways of knowing the three types of knowledge in chapter 18 one one the so this is 18 uh, 20 it starts at 18 20 and it says one kind of knowledge is where you see oneness in everything and it, this is this was very interesting to me because it is where I think there are different types of scholars as well so one kind of scholar who makes connections you see the similarities and connections between things whether that's the your where you whether it's a western and the indian tradition you see you look for the connections it depends on what you're looking right you'll see what you are looking what you're looking to see and so it says you see the the kind of knowledge by which you see 
one in everything. That's that's the best, the sattvic kind of knowledge. Then there's a kind of knowledge which is analytic, what we would call analytic, where you are you have a view of separateness and you're kind of trying to understand the differences between things. So if your focus is on difference, then you'll always be saying this is different from that. Of course, things are both different and similar, but it depends what do you want to focus on. And the third type of knowledge is very funny, which is 1822, which says, which is the tamsic type of knowledge, where you are attached without any reason to one particular idea and you just want to impose that on everything so this is the kind of thing you start with a formula <laughs> ideology. Or an ideology and you want to impose that on every text and everything that you ever come come across and uh, so i thought these three it really very succinctly sums up the three ways of approaching the world of worldview as well as scholarship and everything that these really are the three ways of knowing and um as far as animals are concerned, yes, that was my main conclusion. I mean, I was very surprised in the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, but the Mahabharata particularly by the the complexity of the debates about animals, things that we think are only now invented in the West, like the so-called veganism, for example, that should we be drinking the milk of the cow, which is meant for the calf. Now, I would have thought this is a modern idea, but I discover that it's in the Mahabharata. They, more than once, people say should, that you should only drink the milk after the calf has drink, and the sages only drink the froth from the calf's mouth. They don't want to deprive the calves of the milk. So yeah. the depth and the intensity of the discussion about cruelty to animals is not just about eating them that is there of course but how much eating Bhishma goes into the Bhishma being a Kshatriya goes into these details of okay if you have best is not to eat animals but if you have to eat them then don't eat during this month and during that month and don't eat in these days and eat so which is what many most Indians are still doing which is eating a very limited amount of meat even the meat eaters most yes. of the country, not everywhere, eat a very limited amount of meat because certain days of the week they don't eat, certain months they don't eat. And then even, you know, I grew up as a non, in a non-vegetarian family. It was all meat was only eaten three times a week. So then overall, India consumes much less meat than, say, China or Japan, many other countries, you know, because meat is not the main item of food. So I thought that was brilliant. That, that is already there in the text. They're thinking not only about eating the animals, but how much and how often and how and all of that. And... Um, uh, and then there are different viewpoints on vegetarianism. Again, there's a debate about it. It's not that everybody agrees and so on. So that was uh, very, very fascinating to me. And then, of course, the point that, which now in the West, many people would, would say that there isn't an essential difference between humans and animals. And so we should not be eating animals. And that you know, from the 19th century onwards, I would say late 18th, 19th century onwards, people have been, Bentham said that, right? That there is, uh, if the animal, if the, if the question is not whether the animal can reason or can talk, but is it suffering? If it is suffering, then you shouldn't be inflicting suffering on it if it is capable of suffering. Uh, so that is exactly what is being said in the Mahabharata also, that, that we know, and a reason is involved though, because it says, we know that the, you know that the animal is suffering. And you know, he also gives the example of the slave. Or the, so you know the slave is suffering, still you are being eating them and kept keeping them as a captive. So it doesn't make a difference whether you're enslaving a human or an animal, you're making them suffer, you know they are suffering. How do you know they are suffering? Because they have the same senses as you have. So just by reason, you know that if I have senses and I am suffering, then they have senses and they are suffering too. And the difference I would say is that from, from a very ancient period, uh, the, the texts are, are pointing out this fact that there isn't an absolute difference between humans and non-human animals. The word animal in English, it comes from anima, which means spirit in Latin. So in the Western world too, there is a consciousness that there is a spirit, the animal has a spirit. And in Hinduism, it's much more front and center that yes, the animals have consciousness, they are talking, they're speaking, they're agents in the text, right? So there's, they are given full agency. And um, so I wouldn't say there's an absolute difference between Indian and Western views, Hindu and Western views of um, animals. But what it's much more dominant in the Western thought is the idea that humans are superior to animals. And that is, I wouldn't say that that idea is missing from Indian thought either. In Hindu thought also, there is the idea that there's definitely the idea that the human life is the highest life. But why? Because the human birth is the highest birth because it is the most capable of liberation, right? The most capable of seeking liberation. So yes, but then there's also the simultaneous awareness that humans and animals are not different in kind. It's only a difference of degree. And... Uh, yeah, so I think it's uh, very advanced thinking, really, on 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 animals. And I should have maybe said in this. And my other point, which uh, about animals was, 
that the dharma, when I'm talking about the dharma of justice, the dharma, the only dharma that is really available to everyone, to every human being, however oppressed that human being may be, the only dharma available to all is the dharma of kindness to animals. Because however poor or otherwise oppressed you are, everybody, every human being has more power than some animals and insects and birds do, right? You always have the ability to inflict cruelty on animals. And if you don't do that, that is really the highest dharma. And the dharma, it's repeatedly said in the text, it's a, it's a formula that is repeatedly said in the text that uh, 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 the highest dharma is the dharma of kindness to all um, beings, right? And that that anybody can practice, especially when it comes to animals. So I should have perhaps in the subtitle instead of species said animals, mm -hmm. but I didn't, and that would have made it clear and I should have said that, but I said species because I, because humans are also animals. So therefore I didn't want to just, uh, then to say non-human yeah. animal, then it would make it too long, which is why I said species. But yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe that wasn't entirely clear then to readers. Yeah. I, I also love out the phrase uh, dharma of justice you know uh, it's not dharma and justice or dharma justice or dharma of justice which mm -hmm. i thought was really beautiful because you're inquiring into justice here um, what is justice yeah and actually i mean uh, this whole thing about animals and the point that you made earlier about the, the third kind of a thinking the tamasic way of thinking where a particular structure is imposed upon everything else it mm -hmm. brings me to some of the criticism of the, in reviews that i've seen um, about your book uh, because what i've seen in such people who are critical about the book is that they are trying to impose certain ideas on the book and they expect you to say something about these books and when they do not see you say those things about these books, you know, they are upset. You know, they think maybe you're misrepresenting them. You know, like uh, there's one particular author, she says that, you know, differentiates between historians and mythologists, uh, you know, <laughs> and then says, you know, a, a mythologist doesn't really, you know, uh, misrepresent, but they're in a way distorting uh, the message and things like that in the sense that you're actually conveying the wrong message about what Mahabharata should be saying. You know, <laughs> that Mahabharata doesn't really talk about the debates and there is no possibility of a debate, you know, that could actually happen and Mahabharata could not communicate anything about debates happening. You know, that it's it's really difficult to understand. So, yeah, we we have seen a couple of such reviews and uh, you know, I thought... I hadn't read that particular review. That, I hadn't read that particular review that you just quoted bits from it and sent to me, but um, interesting. Well, of course, I know that she takes the view that all the Sanskrit texts are grammatical and patriarchal and, of course, the Buddhist texts are the wonderful liberatory text. Yeah. The Buddhist, as I showed in the book, Buddha is saying something about Varna, about Brahmins, not very different from what characters in the Mahabharata are saying, but Buddha says... The Brahman is, he doesn't say there's no such thing as a Brahman and get rid of all of it. He says a Brahman is one who acts in a particular way and who sees the same same in all, sees all as the same. That is a Brahman. That's exactly what Yudhishthira and Bhrigu and any number of people in the text in Bhabharata also say. So I don't see the Buddha saying something very different. He's not saying, no, get rid of all the idea of a Brahman. No, he says that a Brahman is one who acts in a particular way. Anybody can be a Brahman who acts in this way. That's what some of the characters in the Mahabharata also say. But she calls me a mythologizer not a mythologist a mythologist is somebody who studies you're right you're right actually mythologizer mythologizer is somebody who's making up myths in other words telling lies and so she's basically accusing me of lying about the text which i find which yes. i expected yes. from a Marxist historian so nothing about that so i i just yeah. find no, I, I thought, I mean, she's actually imputing to you what she does or what they do. You know, she says, how do we evaluate or understand Vanita's enterprise? Enterprise, you know, yeah, that's right. the word that she what uses. What is the project or the enterprise? Yeah. So yes, yes. You know, and then she says, many of the these strategies right. are in, many of these strategies are in evidence in Vanita's work. So I think it, it's probably what they would normally do they are imputing to you and and so that's i i wanted to ask you in that context of what uh, was being said there you now why did you want to write this book uh you know what was your motivation um uh, to write this book you've been working with this text mahabharata as you have said you've read several times and you've read it very closely and you've been writing about mahabharata for more than i think 20 uh uh, well, I haven't been consistently now. writing about it, but I haven't engaged with But, but uh, I want to write it because I found, I was so surprised and startled by so many things in it. Just this debate about Varna or the or the fact of the centrality of Vidura and Sanjaya or the, as, as teachers of Dharma, 
or the debate around vegetarianism, uh, not just vegetarianism, cruelty to animals and kindness to animals. I didn't know that there was such an in-depth debate with all these nuances and all the, I was really taken, and then the Mahabharata says, whatever is not here is nowhere. Uh, it, 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 I was really startled. And I think most people don't know about this. I didn't, and most people don't know. And it's hardly mentioned and hardly talked about. There's that wonderful passage about the grocer, the the, the Veshya, the grocer who runs a grocery shop and lovely description of his shop too. It sounds just like a Kirane ki Dukan today. <laughs> <laughs> and he's there and he gives this very radical uh, 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 exposition of vegetarianism and not harming, not just vegetarianism, but not using animals to work and not harming them. And the guy who's listening to him as a Brahmin who is totally surprised and says, like, how can you run the world like this? The world will fall apart if you don't use animals at all. And he's not faced by that. They have this great debate. And I, this is, I'd never heard of this debate. Hardly anyone has written about it, but certainly ordinary people don't know about it. You said that we all think we know yeah. the Mahabharata stories, but we don't. We don't know that these wonderful things are there and these debates are there and it about every issue, about gender, about sexuality, about one, about animals, etc. We don't know that it's there. So I wanted to write to foreground these stories that have been neglected, these debates and dialogues and stories, which are not known and which have been neglected and which are very interesting. So I think the reviewer should engage with the specifics of a good reviewer should A, give okay. you an idea of what the, what's the work of a review is to give you the idea of what the book is about, what it's talking about. And then secondly, it is to engage with the specifics. Do you not agree with it? Do you think the debate on vegetarianism, for instance, or on animals is not really as thorough as I'm saying it is, or the debate on gender or whatever it is? You, that's what you should engage with. Instead of trying to find out what my motives are, like what is my enterprise, and then take me apart. <laughs> and again, I don't find that way of reviewing useful, but it's amusing and whatever they want to do, that's fine. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 you know, I wanted to just also mention this, and I apologize if, uh, you know, you don't like this comparison or if it offends you or you know anything uh, otherwise. But you know, when I um, read your work, when especially this particular book, I get the sense that this is actually complementary to other kinds of writing, specifically, you know, what we have seen from authors like Wendy Doniger, right? Uh, because she has also written, for example, on her book on Hinduism on Hinduism. Um, and on she has written on animals uh, she has written on sexuality she has written on yeah. gender right so the she's her concerns are very similar she is going to the same uh, uh, texts but the beauty that you are bringing out in this book and the various facets the various extensive debates that you are actually highlighting which are actually ignored by uh, most of these people so i see that there's a certain kind of a this your, your book is like an answer uh, to her um, you know uh, work uh, of the last fifty years and um, also maybe in a sense uh, a complementary uh, what do you think about this and wh what is your view of uh, her work and how do you contrast your work? I think with you're thinking of something that is an answer to her work. Um, uh, there's much greater scholarship than mine. Like I would say, Diana X book, India Sacred Geography. Yeah. I, oh I, yeah. Marvelous book, and it is it's really yeah, uh, to uh, to uh, yeah. without claiming to be an answer. Yeah. It really is the answer because when you when uh, the Doniger school, I, I won't want I will not talk about her individually. The Doniger school is kind of saying there's no such thing as Hinduism. There are all these different people doing all these different things, and Diana Eck is showing that there is a continuous tradition of understanding the subcontinent as bound by roots of pilgrimage and as bound, and that all as all the gods are related to each other. So even though you may be worshiping different gods and have different traditions, they're all related. And you come physically, you come to the same pilgrimage places throughout the country from various different uh, traditions. I mean, I'm summing up very uh, simplistically. But I think that's a real answer to Doniger at one level. And uh, at the other level, as, uh, yes, Doniger is talking about animals and sexuality, but her focus and her approach is entirely different from mine she's basically <laughs> saying that hindus are uh that the Hindu tradition and Hindus in general have been homophobic and patriarchal and brahminical and all of these things and um and that they're doing all these wild you know things by worshiping these different animals and stuff so it's great fun they're doing all it's, it's so there's a certain amount of fun in her writing that yes they are, they are having great fun they're worshiping all these things there isn't a sense of the sacred and i i'm i'm looking at it differently because yes it's there's playfulness and there's uh enjoyment and everything in the practice there's color and rasa and ranga and all that but there's there is sacredness and that that sacredness has a philosophical underpinnings it isn't just that 
Hindus just want to worship everything and therefore they worship everything. No, it is that there's a the philosophical underpinning to that is that everything, there is a oneness to everything. Shiva is a half uh, female in the Arunarishwara form, not just because Hindus are just see uh, everything in this <laughs> mystified way and no, a queen sleeping with horses and whatever and you know it's, it's because there is a philosophical underpinning to that that every god is everything it's not just shiva every god is both male and female and neuter and animal and the mountain in, in the gita krishna says i'm the mountain i'm the serpent i'm the i'm the uh, goddess he's, he's everything it's not just shiva it's krishna too so the, when you say shiva the erotic ascetic as if there's something special about shiva krishna's is the same. Krishna is like that too. Krishna is also everything, right? And the Vishwarupa, uh, the, that whole list of things that Krishna is. And that everyone is everything, that there is multiplicity in all of us. So it's a philosophical and I think very accurate philosophical and psychological understanding of the world and of humans and of animals and of everything, that we are all many things. Yeah, that's that's the basic. Uh, and there is no such thing as a pure one thing or the other. Everything is a mix and at different degrees, at different, except for the Atman. And she, you would notice that she completely ignores the Upanishads. If you look in her index, I think the Upanishads appears twice. The Upanishads are completely ignored. Why? Because they, they focus on the Atman and on the self and on with what the Upanishads are doing. It's as if it's gone, as if it's not there, as if all there is is the Puranic, uh, the Puranic narrative. But what happened to the Upanishads? Uh, is there no philosophy? Where's the philosophy? So if you're looking at Hinduism without philosophy, uh, I mean, I think your European scholars, the so-called Orientalists who get such a bad name, they did much better. They had a real people like Thoreau and Emerson and so on. They had an understanding of the, they read the Upanishads, they had an understanding of self, self and consciousness and all of that. So we do better to go back to that, to that. If we have to read European scholars, I think though they were the better scholars, many of them. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, almost running out of time, my last question, um, you know, it, I think it, it's a good segue into that question. In fact, um, uh, you know, one would not probably consider today, you know, when uh, the students uh, read the Odyssey or the Iliad or even Plato's dialogues that they're actually religious texts. You know, they may not be canonical sacred texts, but they are, in fact, uh, in a sense, uh, religious, you know, uh, oh. for the Greeks. Uh, yeah. But they, are, they would not be seen as something, um, you know, that uh, cannot be taught uh, in schools because they are religious, right? Um, but the moment we talk about Mahabharata or Ramayana, you know, uh, being taught in schools or to students, suddenly there's a whole debate about secularism and Hindutva and Hindu nationalism and, you know, imposition of these uh, patriarchal Brahminical texts, uh, you know, on students and all that. But uh, there's beauty in these texts. And um, when vast majority of time uh, our children are spending is in schools, and uh, hardly there is an opportunity, uh, you know, an opportunity to teach uh, children at home. How could we get our children to appreciate the beauty of these texts? Well, for one thing, we did study them in school a little bit. For instance, when you study Hindi literature, the history, so you study the, what is the history of Hindi literature? When you, have, you study Tulsidas, then you have to read a part of the Manas, right? Or you study Mira, you yeah. have to read what she's saying about Krishna, and she's referring to the Gita and the Mahabharata all the time, right? So it's not completely avoidable unless you want to stop studying literature itself. And I'm sure yeah. in Tamil, they're studying Kamman or whoever. You can't completely get rid of these things, right? Um, secondly, yes, for small, for children now who are mostly studying in English, I wrote out, for example, I wrote out the entire Ramayana and Mahabharata in very simple Hindi in notebooks I wrote out to teach my son so that he could read it and get the story. And I, you know, so you, parents need to make that effort to teach it if it's not being taught in the, very much in school. As far as the Greek texts are concerned, of course, they're religious texts. And for the Greeks, again, they don't make this modern Western distinction between religion and the non-religious. There's no such thing. The okay. whole world is pervaded by the gods, right? The river has a god in it, the trees have gods yeah. in it, the sun is a god, the moon is a god. And that's how Hinduism is too. The, the life, the world, yourself are pervaded by the divine. And there's no absolute difference between the divine and the human. Odysseus and Athena, they are friends. And there's no absolute division, just like Arjuna and Krishna are friends. One is human, one is divine, but there's no absolute division. So this kind of absolute division between God and human, which is a Christian division, and then the absolute, not Christian, Abrahamic division, and then the absolute division between the religious and the non-religious, 
imposing this on cultures where that is not the case. You can't you can't divide the two. In the case of the Greeks, you can do it only because that religion has been destroyed. All the Greeks were converted. So you can <laughs> yes. now the religion doesn't exist. So now it has been made Got safe it. and and it's, you can teach it, right? Because nobody takes that religion seriously anymore. I mean, I do, but <laughs> some of us do, but most people don't. So you if so you can, it doesn't seem like religion to you at least seems like some sort of fairy tale or whatever. But as far as Hinduism concerns, is still a, it's a living religion, and so the 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 stories of the Mahabharata and Ramayana they are living stories. Hence, they're kind of not so safe, and they're seen as uh, they seen as more dangerous than the Greek stories. Otherwise, there's no real uh, difference there. But yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so Shimna, yeah, I think... uh, wonderful, wonderful talking to you, uh, The book is beautiful. Uh, I want to recommend it to uh, our audience. Uh, if you can't read the Mahabharata itself, please read this book because you'll get a lot out of it. Uh, that hasn't been highlighted by uh, other scholars. Scholarship has ignored uh, several aspects of um, the epics that you highlight, Ritwanitaji, uh, and and uh, the book is a treasure for that reason. And you have picked and chosen exactly those parts of the text that 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 complicate uh, you know any simplistic understanding of national dharma of gender and um you know the 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 sense of ethics that you finally highlight is is uh, so beautiful and relevant and uh, you know makes um makes us rethink the the assumptions that we have about uh, hindu philosophical thought so <sighs> There is a, a kind of a, a, a revival of interest in Mahabharata. We are seeing a lot of books, fiction, yeah. non-fiction, yeah. you know, that are coming out by a lot of authors. Yeah. But um, that's the way it's reading, reaching the general readers. There's so many books which retell the, the story in great detail now, uh, in, yes. in no, almost like novels, right? So I think it's really yes. Good. Yes, 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 and 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 your book, I know, I I felt among all that I have seen in recent times, brings out the essence of Mahabharata and the epics you know, Ramayana uh, uh, much more and it gives a leaves a lot to think about you know for people who read uh, and you know really inspires them to go to the original text and oh does it really have this debate let me go and read what she actually says or what he actually says you know that's so wonderful about your book I'm really and glad people are not put off by the fact that it's a, it looks like an academic book but it's actually written for a general reader really simply, oh yeah. absolutely absolutely no it's that's exactly what I was in fact uh, saying to uh, Sushumna that it's such an easy reading and it it's so easy to read this but it is extremely uh, academic in the sense that there's a reference uh, footnotes given for each and every uh, you know the thing that you talk about in this book so Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your effort in bringing this out. And we're really grateful to you and uh, really great talking to you today. And I hope we have more of these conversations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Srinivas Ji, for asking thank you, interesting questions. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank thank you. you. Namaste. Namaste.